Welcome to Field Sports Britain, this week coming from Ireland, the home of Field Sports. We're down in the beautiful grounds of Burr Castle Domain in County Offaly and it's bigger and better than ever. We have falconry, shooting, fly casting, gun dogs, terriers, lurchers, all the things you expect to find at a real game fair. We've got the shooting, we've got the fishing and the falconry. You know we understand fox hunting. What makes us Irish great at field sports is our attachment to our horses, dogs, guns, rods and everything else we need in the field. We are traditionalists, but we are always interested in new thinking. When people see horses like Mandy here behaving in a certain way, they take a huge interest in how and why and what's wrong with my horse. And It's always good to come back to show simple training techniques uh, to help them, and yeah, and then they become innovative uh, at the end of it, you know. Mandy, you're a horse, what do you think? Oh, that's a good answer right there. <laughs> um, what kind of, what kind of um, uh, is she? This is an American paint quarter horse. Um, the color, the paint refers to the color, obviously, and the quarter horse refers to an American breed which was bred originally to run a quarter mile, and that's why they call them quarter horses. The horse first came to Ireland 4,000 years ago, so they say. We've done all right with them since. We've been falconers for a long time too, and Trevor Roach gives a display of local birds as well as those from further afield. But falconry has always been a hunting tool. Even though we're on display here today, in my private time, we hunt rabbits. During the, the, the season from November to January, we use our game falcons, we hunt pheasants and ducks. So that's the main priority to us. Is, is keep the falconry tradition going, keeping it alive and being, being careful and we don't abuse the system. Everything is under licensing and this is how we, we, we channel our business. This is different, this is the display boards and show people how we fly. That's where we, we, we stand on the issue and we hope to do, do a good job promoting it as a sport rather than uh, as we stand here today. Again, they're not pets and this is the first thing I'd like to say. Anyone who sees me here today with owls and the barn owls, they're all saying, oh, such lovely, we'll get one for the child. It's an instant no-no. Do not get an owl. They are very, very difficult to handle. If anyone's interested, give me an email. There's no problem. We can send you in the right direction. We'd hate to send you off in the wrong direction. This magnificent species is Teddy, the Eurasian eagle owl. And um, he's also 18 months old. He weighs six and a half pounds. And he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a beauty, he's a good looking bird and he's very, very popular with the crowd. And he's quite partial to microphones. He is, he, again, he's taking a now look at the microphone there, if you raise it up, he, he'll bite it, there you go. There he is, Teddy, Teddy Live, I told you to do it, and he's going to go again. Let's leave the Emerald Isle and come back to bright blue Britain. David is sitting on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Britain News. A man of the cloth has been found wounded and shaken after a large bird of prey attacked his geese. The very reverend Hunter Farquharson tried to protect his large Toulouse geese at his home in Scotland from an attack by a fish eagle which had been introduced to the area. He says he blames the RSPB for releasing the large raptors without consulting local people. I don't know who gives the RSPB the right to, to, to decide on Scotland's heritage and, 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 and who, you know, who, who did they consult? They say they did a two-year consultative process, but we were never consulted in this area. Rural people are fighting back against crime. A farmer's wife from Herefordshire is so tired of having her farm equipment stolen, she started a new website, it's been nicked.co.uk. So far, the website's helped recover items such as two Dachshund puppies, a horse trailer that was listed on eBay, and an accordion. There's no stopping George Digweed this year after he claims yet another shooting title. After four days of intense competition at the British Open at the West Midlands Shooting Ground, George shot 117 from 120 to win by three targets. 
The win caps off a marvellous season for the 19 times world champion. We're still searching for the biggest foxes in Britain. We pass the data onto the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust and every six months we give the shooter with the best picture and story of a fox a Rivers West jacket. The latest contender is Mark Jennings from County Armagh. It's certainly a decent size measured against his 40-inch Tika rifle. Unfortunately, Mark didn't weigh this fox. He assured us it was well up there, having a high-protein diet of pheasant poult, the big bugger. The rural Oscars are underway again. They celebrate people going the extra mile to ensure that the British countryside is flourishing. You can nominate people and businesses now at www.countrysidealliancewards.org.uk Two friends have boated what's believed to be the biggest brace of conger eels in British history, weighing in at £209. Simon Hughes and Mark Nelson were fishing over a wreck out of Torquay in Devon when they caught the 103 and 106 pounders. To see all the pictures and read the full story, buy this week's Angling Times. And finally, the BBC's amusing countryside programme, Countryfile, decided to cover grouse shooting last weekend. However, they decided to accompany the piece with music from their horror and suspense music library. So here's a tribute to our national broadcaster. <coughs> Stay with us as up next is Roy Lupton with a right royal bird of prey and a pesky peregrine. But now you're up to date with Field Sports Britain News. Stalking the stories, Fishing for Facts. Over the next few weeks, we're going to see the training and development of a collection of hawks, eagles and falcons. Roy now has a crowned eagle called Daisy, a Benelli's eagle, a peregrine known as the Dude, a troubled young goss said to be untrainable by his previous owner and, of course, Roy's new brood of gosses. But first, let's meet Daisy. I've had her for just over a week now um, and normally with the training of a, of a young bird I start with weight reduction as soon as I get them uh, but with uh, Daisy here uh, we've not been able to go straight into that process because obviously she was still still growing her feathers and still had a little bit of body growth to do so we've been uh, just allowing her to develop and allowing her to grow and still feeding her a couple of times a day so we've not been able to do any of the, the normal training or any of the, the, the further training, all we've been doing is, is manning basically, which is getting the eagle used to everything that she's going to be around and seeing everything that she's going to be working with. So she's getting used to us, she's getting used to the dogs. Hey, sweet, oi, hey, good girl, oh, I know. So you can see she's still a little bit nervous at the moment. She's just looking at me then, not quite sure what was going on. But uh, no, she's, uh, she's calming down quite well. Roy is training her on behalf of a client and after a couple of seasons hunting she will probably end up in a breeding program. So what's her natural quarry in Africa? In the, in the wild they predate on uh, a, a lot of primates, um, so uh, monkeys make up a, a lot of their diet. So obviously when they catch one animal uh, within the group the other animals might come in and try and intimidate her or try and you know attack her. So. Uh, what she does or what they, they do is the lift their crest, raise their crown, which makes them look a lot more intimidating. So uh, scaring the rest of the troop away so she doesn't get, uh, get attacked while she's on uh, one of the monkeys or one of the family members of the group. She even looks pretty regal when she eats, almost griffin-like. Next up is the Benelli's and a way in before a bit of gentle training and exercise. It really is a step-by-step -step process, but the birds learn incredibly quickly. So with the, uh, the Benelli's, again, there's not very many of them being bred in the UK. Um, there's a couple of guys uh, that are breeding them now in captivity. Uh, but there's not, uh, you know, they're obviously nowhere near as common as some of the other birds that we use in falconry. So again, for a lot of us, uh, it's a, a new experience training some of these birds and just realising what their capabilities are. And uh, obviously in their, their native um, Spain and up through uh, some parts of Africa, then they predate on a lot of birds. Um, you can see he's got quite long, quite long toes, uh, which for a lot of hawks uh, points towards them being bird catchers. But 
Over here we tend to fly them on uh, a lot of ground quarry, so he'll fly on, on hares and maybe the occasional rabbit. One bird that hasn't learned enough is this young female goss. She is a bit nervy and Roy is trying to establish trust with a bird that has been returned to him. Apparently she has a screw loose and is untrainable. The guy um, phoned me up last week saying that uh, the hawk was uh, not doing what it should do and. Uh, that it was, uh, un well, his, his, his uh, words were, it was untrainable um, and he didn't like it and uh, wasn't happy with it. So uh, I said to him that if he, you know, if he wasn't 100% happy to, to bring it back um, and he, he brought it back and sort of explained what had been going on with her. Um, and he said he'd had two uh, goshawk experts look at the bird and they said that she was, she was mad. Um, you know, it's like he, he said that uh, you know, she had a, a bit of a screw loose, she wasn't quite right. Um, and I think really all that's happened with her is, you know, some birds obviously require a, a very different training method. What well, I say, a very different training method. Some birds require a little bit more understanding and you've got to understand what the bird's doing, what the hawk's doing, what's going on in their heads and then you've got to adjust your training program dependent on that bird. There's no one training process that works for, for you know, there's no one, uh, if you like, method that fits all birds. So with her, she just needed a, a little bit more time. And when you watched the way that the, the, the guy was working with her, um, his movements were very erratic and he was very sharp with his movements. And it, I think she'd just become, you know, absolutely petrified of the guy. So uh, I've been working with her for a couple of days now. We've taken her weight up a little bit because she was very sharp. Um, but she's, you know, she's coming on really, really well. Before we head out into the field with Ian's goss for a bit of rabbiting, we're introduced to the dude. He is going to get some exercise this morning, but the weather is incredibly warm, so Roy doesn't expect a brilliant performance from his peregrine. Roy gets in a flap and tries without much luck to move on the local pigeon population oh, so as not to distract his get him, bird. Uh, get him up to a, a much Time pitch. to talk us through a very important bit of kit for any falconer, yeah, telemetry. Okay, so we're uh, just setting the, the telemetry up. Um, we've just got a, a little Tearsall Peregrine here that you probably saw on uh, one of the episodes when he was a, a chick running around on the kitchen table. So he's a, a full imprint, but he's got, you wouldn't believe it, he's got absolutely lovely manners. So uh, I've, I've, I've done something right here. I don't know how, how I've quite done it. So before we put the telemetry on, we always just check and make sure that we've got a good solid signal coming off of the unit so you can see the unit's working quite nicely there we're getting a good signal so it's working as should there we go and we'll whack that on him hey son thank you so just cable tie that on you can tail mount them or some people uh, put backpack mounts on them or even neck mount telemetry but I always prefer to put anything on the legs, so you know you're, th you're safe, and then he's ready to go. The dude is now ready to show us what he's made of. Oh, he's gone. And we get a real demonstration of telemetry in use. He's not gone far. I think as he just started to mount, he was just, getting, just starting to look for a little bit of um, lift over the trees there. And uh, they're ploughing the fields just behind this bank of trees. So there was probably a few pigeons and stuff out there. He might have gone and, uh, and played with, it, with uh, some of those. So we're going to have a bit of an impromptu lesson, I think, in uh, the use of telemetry. Thankfully, we find him playing with some crows. He comes swooping in, but then takes a breather on top of a caravan. Finally, the dude comes to the lure. The heat really has affected his performance. After all that no, feeding and training, it's weekend. time for hunting. And, uh, Ian has had about nine kills with his bird already this season, but the woodland could prove taxing for a hawk that is used to longish flights across open ground. With the ferrets meandering from hole to hole, and after some patient waiting, the odd thump through the earth giving the game away, we get a couple of really exciting flights. She got it? That was tricky, where it come underneath us, she had to more or less stop and then turn right back. So let's get back over there for another one bolts. Oh! Yes! Oh! Has she missed it? No, she missed it. Go on, go on, go on! Oh. 
There it goes. Still going, still going. Still going, still going. Oh. Exciting, but frustrating for Ian and his bird. Roy can't help smiling. There's a bit of competition between these two. Don't. <laughs> Seriously. We've got a very unhappy Ian. Obviously, it's really, really difficult in conditions like this because it's, it's so enclosed. Um, for a young hawk, I mean, she's only been flying for a couple of weeks, so twisting and turning through all of these uh, scrubby bushes and what have you is, uh, is putting her to the, uh, the ultimate test. But uh, yeah, Ian, Ian thought he was up for it, but you know, he's, he's not quite making beep, the mark beep. yet. <laughs> Finally, the goshawk gets her talons on a rabbit, which she pursues all the way out onto the edge of the wood. Roy certainly has got his hands full this season, but when all these birds have had a dose of the Lupton magic, there should be some very exciting sport in the coming months. Now, before we go back across the water, let's go to Oxford, where they're giving away prizes worth £2,000 for their August events. If you had gone to the Oxford Gun Company in August 2011 for a pre-season sharpener, you could have entered competitions to win prizes worth thousands. The main event is the Browning Rabbit Mania, a combination of four rabbit traps that can lead to glory or insanity. You will see it at game fairs all over the country. Here is Commonwealth Games shooting gold medalist Stephen Walton to explain definitively how to shoot this. The trick is to when you set up for the target, obviously don't bring your gun too far back towards the trap because you'll be chasing it and you don't obviously want to be too far away from the target because you'll be, it's the further it away, the harder it gets. You're nice in between, nice 50% in between, so you see the target, pick it up, shoot it fairly quick because on the pairs, they are extremely fast targets and you need to be on the first one as fast as you can, ready to set up for the second one. The four finalists assemble. Each of them was top shot one week in August and has already won a case of cartridges. Who is going to win? With bouncing bunnies, anything can happen. We line them up and ask them to point. Each goes up to shoot from the Browning Rabbit Mania mobile trailer. Tom Boyer is first and he sets the pace with 18x20. That's going to be tough to beat. Michael Blackwell starts strongly but ends up with just 14, four points from equaling the current top score. Phil Eesman shoots straight when he shoots straight but not consistently enough, he ends on 17. Then Paul Jordan has a go. We will find out later if he beats Tom Boyer's score. The other big prize today is the Novice Schools Challenge. 60 kids have paired down to just 14 and they are here today to compete for £500 worth of shooting kit. Here's one of the younger ones, Brodie Willard. What sort of size shotgun are you using? Um, I'm using a 20 gauge silver pigeon Beretta. Lovely, and you've got, you've got quite an impressive um, lot of stuff in your back as well. Um, uh, yeah. Is that, is that your, it's your vest, is it? Yeah. Terrific, can you just turn around a sec? There we go, right? there's, a, there's a load of badges, okay, turn back again. <laughs> um, so you, you reckon, are you in with the chance today? Um, yeah, I'm in with a good chance. Brilliant, good luck. Thank you. One of the Novice Schools Challenge contenders has come all the way from France for the day. It's Amory de la Doucette's 16th birthday today. Many of the competitors have turned up with their dads. What's it like being anxious and on the touchline? Just, uh, you, you want to get in there and, and do the best for them and tell them where they're going wrong and teach them all my bad habits. <laughs> the competitors have to shoot 30 targets. Scores are mainly in the 20s. Back at the barn, it's the prize giving. First, Stephen Walton tells the audience how he got started in shooting. And now the great reveal. Winner of the Novice Schools Challenge is William Ford. And the Browning Rabbit Mania prize of a B525 shotgun worth £1,500. Paul Jordan scored 15, it goes to Tom Boyer. Not expecting, hoping to win. <laughs> Definitely hoping to win. Stiff um, competition. Yeah. Stiff competition, anyone could have won it. Um, but that's it, it's, uh, it really is ra Browning Rabbit Mania. Um, and anyone could win it, so yeah, no, I'm glad I did in the end. I was hoping to, but uh, yeah, no, really happy, really, really happy. And well, we interviewed you Jake, last when you got your first right and left on the game day schools challenge last year, didn't we? Yes, you did. So, another another triumph, yeah, it's really good. Uh, I'm glad it's my first com one of my first competitions I've uh, won overall, which is really good. And it's just thanks you to all the sponsors and all the support, really. David Florent of the Oxford Gun Company organises the Novice Schools Challenge today. Indeed, the whole year-long Schools Challenge programme. 
What is he trying to achieve? It, Browning and Strapstone came up with the idea really because there's a lot of novices that try to enter into the school's challenge um, which have only just started and they they were competing against people that have been shooting for years so they basically wanted to bring something in that brought new youngsters into the sport uh, that never shot before or shot a little before um, so they could have their own competition to compete for a prize but was within their capabilities of winning now this is a, obviously a, you know, a, a major plus for shooting generally um, but it's, I mean it wouldn't be bad for any sport to boast um, I mean, how does this sit in the context the wider context of other sports well, that's funny. Funny you must say that. Actually, I uh, I watch watch the business news, um, and they're talking about sport, trying to promote all sorts of different sports because we've got the Olympics next year. And it had at the end of the film, uh, if you've got a sport or an event that you think is good for us to cover, give us a ring or an email, and we will try and come out and cover it they phoned me up this morning and said they weren't really interested uh, in shooting they've got enough of, of the other sports to do shooting isn't really a big enough sport for them to put on there now if you have any thoughts about how the bbc covers shooting sports why not get in touch with us you can leave us a comment on facebook or twitter or youtube or pigeon watch or yes we hunt any of the places where we show our program or email me charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv should be appearing on the screen now we are the BBC's Nemesis. We'll gather them all up and we'll send them in and get a response for you. Now it's back across the Irish Sea to Burke. Now you might think that people are here, the shooters are here for the prizes, but believe me, Seamus Lennon, who runs the shooting line here at Burr Game Fair, tells me not at all. They're here for the crack. We have two competitions here today in the sporting layout. One is for the, what we call the championship line. It's for a Beretta Gold D worth 3,000 euros. And second prize we have a clay pigeon trap worth 800 euros. And third prize we have a range finder worth about 500 euros. Tell me about shooting in the, in the area, the Shannon region. Well, it's um, the Midlands course is famous. We have the little Brosnan River here, which just flows not too far from where we're standing now. And it's uh, got a sanctuary about five miles from here where thousands of widgeon and teal come every year to winter. Plus we run the, we rent the shooting rights of the estate here in Borough and uh, we have a private shoot in that state. We release about 4,000 pheasants and about 800 duck every year. None of this world of field sports in Ireland could exist without the work of local gun clubs and hunts and the body that brings them all together, the National Association of Region Game Councils. We are primarily a game bird shooting organisation, but we've now expanded our remit to include all field sports and to support all field sports, but particularly all of the shooting disciplines that are available. Burr Castle is in the Shannon region, the heart of the Irish Midlands. You couldn't be closer to the best of Irish sport. Local gun clubs and everything offer services and would act as, as gillies and scouts and things like that. So they're, they're, and they're very, uh, if a visitor wanted to make contact with the, some of the local clubs, they are generally very accommodating. Um, and uh, a lot of the B&Bs too uh, would have uh, gillies on hand, particularly for fishermen, and would, uh, would know of the good spots. The Irish love of sport goes back to a time when great elk roamed our country. Actually, now that's a moose. Even I am part of history, trying to apprehend this notorious poacher. I've been after him since the Ballywalter and Shane's Castle game fairs earlier this year. At the end of your day in the field, the idea is to bring home the bacon, or the chutney, or the chocolate. Ireland showcases the very best of its food at Burr Castle. Good water and good rivers in Ireland, plenty of water falling from the heavens, and it's soft water, so that is actually perfect in, um, in technical terms, in terms of making uh, good quality whiskey. So the fact that we've abundance of uh, rivers, good water, plenty of fishing and so on, works well with uh, whiskey distillation. It's quite a natural fit. Do you, do, you ever, do you ever waste a dram by pouring it into the river for the good of the salmon? We try never to do that. We try never to do that. No. They do that in Scotland, yes, we don't do that in Ireland. No. So to our viewers worldwide, Slauncher from Ireland, from Cooley, and from Kilbegan. Thank you. Très bon. Guns, horses, hawks and fish. Let's complete the Irish sporting repertoire with dogs. I'm looking for a weakness, maybe a dog to yelp a bit or pull a bit and then I'll know maybe if he was going out hunting tonight he couldn't do the job 100%. So generally that's the way I operate if when I'm judging a dog and if there's no yelp, nobody tweaks a muscle, the dog that going out that night will do a job perfect.
Oh, 100 percent over the moon. <laughs> Never what? thought I was going to get it. <laughs> what, what do you use him for? Ah, uh, just rabbits and stuff. So I'm doing a bit of racing at the shows, you know. You're showing promise on rabbits. Yeah, 100 <laughs> percent. We're a tired but happy crowd starting to head home. More than 30,000 people have been to Burr in the last two days. The Great Game Fairs of Ireland organised the event. Well, we've delivered the third Great Game Fair this year. Three record-breaking performances. First of all at Bally Walter, followed by Shane's Castle and another record here. But we've got to look forward. But this is something that we agreed when we started. You joined the team five years ago. We've got to keep looking forward and keep making them bigger and better every year. Now I think that you've helped us greatly this year to deliver three good ones and three even better ones next year. Well, that's the target. Well, we're back next week. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you have to do, do uh, I don't know, you're meant to push some button, I think. Hit the subscribe oh, button. Oh, hit, sorry, hit the subscribe button. Or go I, to the website. Or go, or go to the website. What's it called? www. It's not great game fairs of Ireland. Field Sports, Field Sports <laughs> Channel. Channel. Dot TV. TV, yes. And put your name in the constant. Put your name in the little box. That's right. Or click to like us on. Or click to like us on Facebook. Or follow us on Twitter. And you'll get our programme sent to you every week. That's <laughs>